Greetings. This is a commentary and sermonette on the song, A Day in Thy Courts. This is song number 52. I think this was probably in 1980. It's when I was at the Street Gospel Mission in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And this is one of the songs that Jane Fontaine worked harmonies to and even sang several of the lines. We traded off on some of the lines. I believe it was this one and another song in particular I haven't recorded yet, Jesus My King. I told Jane at one point I was really tired of these songs and didn't like them much anymore. And she said, well, it's still a good song. It's just you sung it too much. So maybe that's it. But the lyrics are great, so I want to go through this. And maybe the song is okay too, but I'll let you be the judge of that. Four day in thy courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to lounge in the tents of wickedness. I want to stop right there. You're going to find that throughout this song I'm spiritualizing a lot of maybe physical truths. For example, when Moses, after the Exodus, would meet with God in the tent of meeting, says that God would speak to Moses thus face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses returned to the camp, his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. So he was basically a doorkeeper there at the tent, sounds like to me. So in our instance though, well, where are the courts that we enter into? Well, by the blood of Jesus and through his body, which the veil in the temple represented his body, that we've now, with that body torn for us, we're able to enter in to the most holy place before God the Father with petitions and prayers and requests and thanksgivings we're able to enter into the most holy place based on the merits of Christ and we can come in confidence we're told but I'd rather spend a day there than a thousand days outside I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God just hanging around than to lounge in the tents of wickedness now lounging in the tents of wickedness listen to this we know that no one who is born of God sins to practice sin because he says earlier in the same book that if anyone says he has no sin, he's deceived himself and the truth is not in him. So we know that no one who is born of God or begotten of God or has been begotten of God sins, but he who was begotten of God keeps him. I think that's a reference to Jesus himself. And the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God and the whole world now my translation says, lies in the power of the evil one. The power of is italicized, which is a flag that these are words that have been added. That's a bad translation, and I haven't looked at some of the other translations, but it's making it as though the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. That would be being acted upon. This is a middle deponent or passive deponent verb in the Greek, which is to be translated active. And what it is saying, the whole world reclines, it's acting in the evil one. And in the word order, it's actually in the evil one, reclines or lies down or is situated or is constituted or is established in the evil one. In other words, those outside of Christ, it's not that their will is being violated and overpowered by the evil one. It's exactly the opposite. They're very comfortable to recline in the evil one. The whole world reclines in the evil one. Do you still have tents of wickedness in your heart that you run into? Do you? Little areas, big areas that you don't want God in. How do we address this? If by God's spirit, the Bible tells me, I'm putting to death the deeds of the body, I will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And I say led to do what? In that context, he's talking about putting to death the deeds of the flesh. Now, I've gone over this many times. If you've watched other videos, you know, you've heard this before, but we got to keep being reminded anyway. So, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. If you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live for all who are being led by the Spirit of God. These, 
demonstrative pronoun pointing directly to these people. They are the sons of God. Doing what? Putting to death the deeds of the flesh. That's what we're being led. So I said then, so pursue those enemies and overtake them. And don't turn back till they're all consumed but shatter them so they can't again rise. And you'll rejoice as the flesh dies. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. If we delight ourselves in the Lord, he's gonna change what also are the desires of our heart to where it lines up with the things that he wants for us. And it takes a whole lot of trust that God is indeed for us. He does not wanna make our world smaller. The Lord says, you injure yourself when you sin against me. So what we need to do is identify, as the Lord helps us, what sin areas need to be addressed in our life. And this is part of our growth. All sin is big. It's all against God and all means death. When I was at this drug rehab, these guys, they were in drugs and some of them alcoholics. And then, of course, almost all of them smoked. And they would try to quit everything all at once. And I'd tell them, look, that's great if you can. I'll be full support of you but these cigarettes are not a mind-altering drug you've got to get away from the alcohol or you got to get away from this drug use if you practice those things you will not enter the kingdom of God those things have got to be removed now do you want to quit smoking yeah you know it's bad for your health would you want your kids to smoke no you wouldn't want that because you know it's not good but these others you need to focus on first and then you'll address those later so you identify what they are and you pursue them. You've got to be honest with God of how you feel about these enemies. And see, that's the thing. You've got to see sin as your enemy, your personal sin. You've got to determine that it is your enemy. And you must decide you are going to attack it. And that's where you pray and ask God for tools. How do I attack this? And I know there is some sin, and there have been sins in the past that I actually love, and I've got to get honest with God that I love it and ask him to help me to see it the way he sees it, the destructiveness of it. And then I need God to have mercy on me and teach me how to identify it as an enemy that I must overtake. And I'm not going to turn back until it's consumed and shatter it so it cannot again rise. And you'll rejoice as the flesh dies. You're going from death to life. It will always bring rejoicing. When we obey God, it all is always a repentance without regret. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand outside. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to lounge, recline, be comfortable in the tents of wickedness where there's pleasures for a season. Do you still have tents of wickedness in your heart that you run into, do you? You've no excuse to, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. In these paths, keep seeking the King, cleansing ourselves from all defilement of spirit and flesh, attaining to the high call that's found in Christ Jesus. You know, this high call, most people are thinking of some great pastorate or some great evangelist or some great whatever in the heck it might be. Some great worship leader and music and songs. The high call of God in Christ Jesus is holiness. In other words, putting to death the deeds of our flesh and living sensibly and righteously in this present age to where we can hear more readily, more easily, more clearly, the voice of the Son of God, this is the way, walk in it. Or, do you still have tents of wickedness that you run into, do you? Pull up the stakes holding down those tents. So if you've got a tent of wickedness, pull the stake up, whatever it is, there might be all kinds of stakes around it, protecting it, keeping it standing. You gotta go after it. There is no regret when a man repents. See, that's God's job. I don't have to do that. I don't have to promise you that because God promises. There's a sorrow that's according to the world that leads to death, but there's a sorrow according to God that leads to life, leading to a repentance. That word repentance, it means to after mind, meta, after mind. 
noose with the mind. We've had a conclusion about something, some kind of sin area in particular, I'm talking about here now. And we all of a sudden begin to re-examine it, our conclusion, and we weigh it, and we think about it. And we get to a point saying, I was wrong in that former conclusion, and I am now after minding. I am changing my mind about that. Now the first call for repentance is who Jesus is. That's what Peter was calling for in that sermon in Acts, repent and believe. Change your mind, Jews, about who Jesus is, the Lord of glory whom you crucified. Change your mind, reconsider who he is, and change your mind about him. Break all the rods holding those tents up. See, it's one thing to pull up the stakes. Now there's rods holding up. Go in there and break those things down because you will not prosper. You won't prosper with your sin covered up. Now this is a very important proverb. If you want to memorize something, this would be a good one. He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper. That is a promise from God. But he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion will find mercy. It's not just enough to say, oh, I'm sorry and how bad. You've got to forsake it as well. So he who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them or renounces them will find mercy, will find compassion. The mercy we need, first of all, is forgiveness, but also mercy in terms of tools to be able to forsake the sin and to turn and do righteousness. The blessing will shower as by God's power you add to your faith moral excellence or virtue. So you're adding to your faith upright conduct where you're trustworthy. You're adding then to your faith knowledge. A lot of people decry knowledge. Knowledge is critical. How in the world are you supposed to know God's will without knowing what God's will is, which means knowledge? Don't let people talk down knowledge. Now you can have knowledge without accompanying action, but knowledge from God that is correct, accurate knowledge brings joy to our hearts and minds and spirits. Anytime we're learning truth, there is joy in that learning. That's true even in the secular world. If you have good teachers of something, and even if they're unsaved, when people learn, there's a natural joy that comes with that whether it's mathematics or whether it's how to play an instrument and mastering a piece that you have there or learning how to read or um, any number of things like that. There's a natural joy in learning. Well, in learning the things of God, there is a supernatural joy that comes with that because we are learning the things of life. So you add to your faith moral excellence, virtue, your yes being yes, your no being no, conducting yourself in an honorable way as you work with people and you get a reputation that you're, you're a beneficial person. And you add knowledge, it's self-control. That word there is in might. <laughs> it's like might in, this power you contain power, whether it's self-controlling what you wanna say or outbursts or whatever, and perseverance. I think that word there is also patience. So you add to your faith, moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, and perseverance or patience as well as godliness, so you're doing what's right. Brotherly kindness, that's the word you get Philadelphia from, it means to cherish brothers, and agape, and love. If these traits are yours and are increasing, here's the promise, you will never stumble. Let me read this. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, we grow in all of these characteristics. They render us neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Now think about that. You want to never stumble? You just do these things continually. God says you will never stumble because there's no cause for stumbling. 
For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. If these traits are yours and are increasing, you'll never stumble. Practice these things. For in this way, the entrance to the kingdom will be yours. To the kingdom will be yours. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand outside. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to lounge, recline, establish myself in the tents of wickedness. Do you have tents of wickedness in your heart that you run into? Do you? Do you? That's the challenge for all of us. And many times I think the reason we're tested by God, even if we haven't done something where we're being scourged or disciplined, we're being tested. Because there may be some tents in us that we are not wanting God to enter into, to invade, to expose, to challenge us. I don't know what your tents are. Quite honestly, I don't even really quite know what mine are right now. But Paul said himself that even though he wasn't conscious of anything against himself, he was not by that acquitted. He suspected that there may still be some tents of wickedness pitched in different places in his heart that he doesn't even see. And that's where God, in his time and in his way, I'm very confident he will um, shine the light on those tents and he'll come knocking at that door. God Almighty, please help us to open that door and let you come on in. And let us see it as an enemy. Help us to pull up the stakes holding down those tents because there is no regret when a man repents so we can break all the rods holding those tents up because you know we won't prosper with our sin covered up Lord God Almighty thank you for your power and your grace your faithfulness because I know that in my flesh there dwells no good thing but I know that you are in the business of bringing down those strongholds and everything that lifts itself up against the true knowledge of God. So grant that and we'll give you thanks. If not now, we'll give you thanks at the judgment. And if you do it now, that just means we're going to be more useful to you now and we'll be more fruitful as far as the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ being expanded. And Lord God, you know that's really what we want. What other road is there to choose to go down? Well, I want to thank you for listening. And uh, I'm going to Stop right there. And like I always say, listen and you will learn. And these are the things that lead to life. And you will indeed live. Hope there wasn't bugs flying around on the limbs there. If by God's spirit, the Bible tells me there's a fly hanging around. At least no locusts.